Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers. We're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We have a real treat for you uh, tonight. We're here to launch Glass Bricks by Luella Lester, published by At Bay Press. You'll be hearing from a whole uh, cornucopia of voices this evening, uh, including the, both the book's author and uh, a wonderful host that we have lined up tonight as well. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, copies of Glass Bricks are available from McNally Robinson Booksellers, naturally. You can visit us in person, you can give us a call, or you can order online. I'll uh, throw up some information about that into the chat so you have that uh, handy as well. Uh, I'll also point out that uh, following tonight's presentation and readings, there'll be an opportunity for you to have some questions answered uh, by Luella. So as questions occur to you, feel free to write them in the Q&A box right at the bottom of the screen. So if we can keep the questions in the Q&A box, that'll ensure that we can find them easily and your host for the evening can uh, put them to Luella when the time is right. But I won't take up too much of your time. Instead, I'm going to introduce uh, the first of the two participants this evening. First of all, I'll tell you a tiny bit about Glass Bricks. Uh, in Glass Bricks, uh, Luella Lester shares her experience working both traditional and traditional jobs. Uh, and non-traditional jobs, the book explores the significance of our basic human right to work in an era where the struggle to find meaningful employment is all too real. But there are stories that are told uh, with great poeticism, uh, panache and humor. Uh, it's both a serious and a very enjoyable collection. Uh, we'll also be hearing from some additional voices that you will hear about shortly. Luella Lester herself is a Winnipeg-based writer and an amateur photographer. Her poetry, fiction, and nonfiction has appeared in journals such as New Flash Fiction, Spelk, Re Reflex Fiction, Vallum, Prairie Fire, The Antigonish Review, Flash, The International Short Story, uh, or Short Short Story Magazine, at CBC News Manitoba Online, and in the anthologies Gush, Menstrual Manifestos for Our Times, published by Frontenac House, A Girl's Guide to Fly Fishing, from Reflex Press, and Wrong Way, Go Back by Pure Slush. So please join me in virtually welcoming Luella Lester. Hi. Hi, uh, okay, sorry, I was thinking that you were gonna introduce someone else. I always have to screw something up right at the beginning and then uh, everything settles down. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's so exciting at the age of 63 to have my first book published. And uh, I really wanna thank uh, uh, At Bay Press, Matt Jowdry and uh, uh, everybody there uh, the, the, for every, everything about it. And if you're in the book, it's all acknowledged in the back. And, and I wanna thank John Taves and McNally Robinson Booksellers where I bought many books in my day. Uh, and it's very exciting to be having a launch with McNally. Um, I want to start with um, just a, a, a reading, and then we'll be doing some discussions uh, and questions and stuff later. Um, uh, so I'm just going to kind of jump right in, and, and uh, uh, I'll start with the... I'll show you the picture that goes with the first piece I'm going to read. Uh, it's a picture of me carrying a log when I'm just a little kid. So take pride in your work, three years old. Stay back, be careful. Outside the edges of this photo, wood chips fly. Dad waves his hand towards me, the one that's not holding the ax. He turns and finishes the chopping. I wait, ready, wearing my overalls. Then he says, now you take this and put it on the wood pile. He hands me a piece, one quarter of a round. Ready for the photo, I hold it high on my shoulder, my smile pulling a chuckle out between my teeth. So I started learning how to work quite young. And I did a variety of jobs along the way. And I eventually uh, was the, the first woman to take diesel mechanics at Red River Community College in Manitoba in 1977. 
And I worked at, uh, as a mechanic for a while before I went back, decided I wanted to go back to university. And I'll read you one of the, just a little uh, snippet from uh, when I was working as a mechanic. It's snippet four. The foreman hurries into the shop carrying a basket of fuel injectors. Following closely behind him is another man who I assume is the trucker attached to the parts. The foreman tells me he has a rush job. The injectors were fixed in Alberta, but something is still wrong and the driver has to be in Toronto tomorrow. He turns to the staring trucker, tells him I'll be looking after him and takes off. You're going to fix them, asks the trucker. Yep, uh, do a good job, eh? I always do. He leaves for coffee and returns an hour and a half later. I show him the parts I replaced and explain what was wrong, saying he shouldn't have any problems now. He smiles, shakes my hand. Well, when I go back through Calgary next week, I'm gonna stop at that shop and tell them a woman did a better job than they did. And uh, eventually I decided to go back to university, but I had to have some money to go to university. I did get some student loans and student bursaries, but I did some jobs. And one of them was uh, working at a donut shop, not too far from where I lived. I used to work weekends. And this piece is called Solo Night Shift. On December 23rd, 1981, 16 year old waitress and high school student Barbara Stoppel was found strangled in the washroom of a Winnipeg donut shop where she'd been working alone. She died a few days later. The wrong man was charged with the crime but was exonerated after three different trials. Later, another suspect was found dead with a note declaring his innocence. The crime was never solved. It's a busy Saturday evening at the 24 hour donut shop where I worked on weekends while I'm in university. I mix icing for donuts. I dip and fix the dripping with a twirl of a fingertip, all the while keeping watch for customers. I smile while I read off the names of the donuts, chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, iced, maple, crullers, jam busters. Smile, stuffing bags and boxes. Smile, making change. Smile, I serve full cups and wipe empty containers in front of the crooked no tipping sign. I stuff a jam buster in my mouth, slurp cold tea, then run to the washroom between customers. Someone is always waiting when I return. I empty the dishwasher, fill it, empty it, fill it, empty. It continues like this until things slow down after 8 p.m. When I'm alone in the donut shop with damp coffee grounds and dried out crumbs, I have time to catch my reflection in the window across from the counter, time to contemplate what might happen if I was to arrange for a friend to visit. I'd set it up so he'd arrive right when I was about to open the till in order to follow the boss's instructions to count out the accumulated money that's kept in a small float before hiding it in the rest of the in the back. And instead, I'd hand all the money to my friend and give him plenty of time to flee before I call 911. And when the cops showed up, I'd muster a few well-timed tears while answering all of their questions and I described the thief as looking different from my friend, but not too different in case some unseen witnesses got a detailed description. And the next day I wait to visit my, at my friend's house until late afternoon in case the police were watching and they'd split the money and I'd spend some of my share on rent and a bus pass and maybe treat myself to a new pair of boots. Hmm. Business is slower than usual on this Saturday night. A winter storm has called away all the tow truck drivers and most other customers. A lone cabbie enters. He's the one who used to ignore the no tipping sign, who once told me I didn't fit in at the donut shop, who said I was destined for bigger and better things. Right before he asked me out on a date, I said no. He has not spoken to me since. He still comes in on Saturdays, 
I serve him his coffee, cream, two sugars, but now he places only the exact change on the counter beside his cup. And uh, the last piece, I'll, I'll do a little bit of reading a little later, but the last piece for this segment is the title story, Glass Bricks. And in case if um, anyone doesn't know what a glass brick is, there is a picture of the glass brick here that I took. And uh, uh, so, and also there's a little bit of swearing in this one. So just to be warned, glass bricks. They can be used for walls or windows, blocking sound and air, admitting only shadow light. They're strong, but they can be broken. I'm working demolition at an old warehouse that's being turned into a piano store, and I've never heard of glass bricks until my boss asked me to chisel them loose, breaking as few as possible, then hump them outside and up a long flight of stairs, four bricks at a time. My arms and hands are numbed by the vibrations of hammer on chisel as I chip away at the cement that has held the glass bricks in place for years. I ride my bicycle across the city each day to work, so my leg muscles are already aching before I climb the scaffolding to loosen the bricks, climb down to stack them by the door, then run them up the stairs. And it's hot, so hot and humid this summer, back and forth, up and down I go all damn day. Late in the afternoon, when I round the corner, one more time, carrying a box of bricks, I see a jogger on the sidewalk, his muscles running like rope up the length of his dap calves and thighs. The sweat on my forehead has turned the cement dust into mud, and with my hands full, I'm unable to wipe it away from my eyes. Fuck you, I think, but I don't say it. You want to stay in shape? Why don't you carry some of these glass bricks up this flight of stairs? I'm sinking now, reaching my breaking point, almost stuck in the gray mud, and he's just a guy running by. Okay, so that's, that's that for that part. <laughs> Thank you so much, Luella. Thanks. Uh, I'm now going to introduce your host for the evening, who will also be uh, reading a brief selection of her own work. Uh, host Angeline Schellenberg's debut, Tell Them It Was Mozart, published by Brick Books, won three Manitoba Brick Award Book Awards and was a finalist for the Realist Award for Poetry. In 2019, she published three chapbooks and received nominations for the Pushcart Prize and ARC Poetry Magazine's Poem of the Year. Angeline hosts Speaking Crow, Winnipeg's longest running poetry open mic, whom, uh, with which many of you are very familiar. Her most recent collection is Fields of Light and Stone, published by the University of Alberta Press. Please join me in virtually welcoming Angeline Schellenberg. Thanks, John. Hello. I'm going to read one work-related poem from my most recent book, Fields of Light and Stone. After the funeral, I pick up my box. Weighed down by solid oak furniture, the gravity of grief, my aunts and uncles divide Opa's home into boxes. For the thrift store, the work clothes worn off the man who built two farms from the ground down, shoveled away snow, soil, and grief till his heart caved went the second mile, passed me a paintbrush, garden hoe, sticky watermelon kiss. Others collect his coins, my inheritance, Opa's crusted boots. <sighs> so I would like to see Luella again, because I have some questions. I can see myself, <laughs> but I don't know if you can see me. I can see you now. Okay. Hello. Can, okay. <laughs> um, so, oh, ironically, in a night all about work, my king. Um, but 
hopefully the phone works. So um, I wanted to know, um, you read about your dad. How did your dad influence your work life? Well, my dad, uh, I, like I'm the youngest of uh, uh, sisters. We're all, all girls in our family. And um, so I was my dad's sidekick. I don't know if it's just because I was the youngest one or, or whatever. And I was his sad sidekick. And my dad was a, a he did a variety of jobs. But uh, one of the longest term was he was a long distance trucker. And uh, so he was only home weekends usually. And uh, uh, if he was fixing a truck outside or something, even if it was winter, I'd be the one that would be hanging out. I think it was more he just wanted company. I don't know how helpful I was when I was little. I remember having cold toes and stuff, but uh, I liked hanging out with him. And so uh, I guess uh, I didn't kind of notice that it was different for a girl to be helping with those kind of jobs. So I think a lot of hanging out with my dad, I kind of was comfortable with working at jobs that might be mo at that time back then only guys were doing certain jobs and and uh so I think that's what influenced in a lot of ways I mean no I wouldn't have gone to Red River and taking diesel mechanics if it hadn't been that I hung out with my dad and and stuff and I never felt like there wasn't anything I could do uh because we did everything my sisters and I we, we cut wood we hauled the you know dumped the toilet pail we dug in the garden we did all kinds of stuff and um and uh yeah so he influenced me a lot in, in that way and also that you could even if you were doing lousy work tough work you could always have a laugh and joke around I think too so I've always managed to find some humor in whatever job I was doing oh, oh I can't I can't hear you Angeline you're muted <laughs> That was because my husband came into the room, sorry. Okay. Um, there's a lot of humor in the book um, that I really enjoyed and the details. Um, <laughs> you remembered which plug the, uh, the electric stapler or whatever it was plugged into. And it just made me feel in these very short pieces that I was right there. Um, <laughs> it's funny so because I had never seen an electric stapler before I did that job for, uh, it was what, back then it had a different name. Now it's called Canada Revenue Agency. But uh, I remember I was quite excited about that stapler. <laughs> yeah. uh, so why did you want to write a book about work? Um, I, I, I think it sort of, it started out just sort of accidentally. I, I was writing poems and I just sort of wrote a few poems about jobs, things that I had. And, and I was, I used to share them at Speaking Crow, some of them. And so a lot of these pieces in this book were poems before they, but then uh, when I ended up, uh, ended up uh, uh, writing them as prose. Uh, and uh, uh, so I just sort of realized, I remember at Speaking Crow, sometimes younger people would come up to me afterwards and say they liked the poems. And I realized uh, that they were all in those kind of jobs. Plus I taught a lot of kids when I used to teach them how to do resumes and all this kind of stuff. And, and I realized that things were a little bit different for them, like where it, I had been working and doing things all along. And there were a lot of kids that I met who, uh, who didn't have like they didn't do any work or something like that and I just so I was just kind of interested in sharing that um, and also I guess uh, I realized that the, the next generation of kids it was a little harder I think they thought maybe they were going to walk into some great job right away and uh, I kind of knew that you had to kind of slog your way through in most cases uh, a lot of things. And sometimes you couldn't figure out what you wanted till you got older. Uh, so I just wanted to share them that with them, some things about work and how um, no matter the job, if you hated the job or whatever, there were always things you learned on the job and all those things, those skills and, and, and stuff uh, you could use down the road when you get the career that really matters to you. Mm -hmm. So what was that 
moment where you discovered what you really wanted to do? Uh, uh, you know, I never, ever had expected to become a teacher. My mom was a teacher, not that there was anything wrong with that. My mom, I think she was a good teacher, uh, but I just never thought I would be following in her footsteps. But uh, when I was at university uh, and I was doing a degree in geography uh, and I, I well, that's how I wound up working at a climate weather, uh, the Environment Canada weather station up north for a summer job and stuff. But uh, I got a part time job at the university when I was doing I was doing an honors degree. And the first year of physical geography students had to take these labs, math, uh, math labs. Uh, and I got a job uh uh, with doing that, helping with that. I wasn't teaching the lab. Uh, a PhD student taught the lab, but I was there kind of assisting. It was a big lab with a lot of students. And students used to say, oh, I, now I understand. And, 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 and I realized that I really enjoyed teaching. And sort of that ended, I ended up going into teaching and, uh, and, and I really enjoyed that too. So I used, I used all those skills, boy, is teaching is for anyone who doesn't know teaching is uh requires a lot <laughs> a lot of work and and a lot of energy and humor yes so in your case those who can do everything teach about it yeah well the thing that was funny about taking a geography degree is i remember one of my profs favorite profs i had a few of them but uh, he said, oh, you know, people in the university will sometimes say, well, at geography, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, you don't master anything. You're just a jack of all trades. Because, But that's what I loved about geography was you could take political geography, development, climate, earth, uh, you know, so many different things in geography. And I hadn't realized that when I was in high school. And um, so then when I ended up teaching geography, I wanted to kind of make sure kids knew what geography was that it was more than just kind of memorizing a map or something, but uh, yeah, so. I'm sure you're an amazing teacher. Well, not you mentioned all. weather. You mentioned <laughs> <laughs> of course not. You mentioned weather, I, I bet you could tell me what's worse than raining cats and dogs. Um, Hailing taxis. Ooh. Okay, right. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Well, if you read the story, I'm not reading it tonight, but the story in there about the, uh, uh, I didn't realize that there was a, such a thing as, as parachutists and people getting caught in thunderclouds and going up and down. And so, uh, yeah, so raining human pieces of hail, although I don't know that they really got coated in hail. I went on a little flight of fancy in that story but you'll have to read it if you want to know what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. So what do you hope readers take away from your book? Um, I think just, uh, well, you know what, first off, just to enjoy, uh, uh, just to enjoy it. And I think for like older people like me or whatever, maybe to just sort of see a little of themselves and they can be thinking about all the stuff that they did. Um, but, and for younger people to just see that everybody kind of has to go through these battles and it takes, you know, these jobs and you don't always get right away what you want. I never started teaching until I was like 31 or something. So, um, so uh, you can, your career or the, you know, your big career can come at any time and, and you just have to kind of learn from everything as you go. And, but mainly I just want people to enjoy it. Excellent. I'm going to duck out. I'm going to see if I can log on to my computer now and I will let you introduce the next. Okay, thing. great. Okay. So um, uh, I didn't want to be the only one reading here. And also it was really important to me that um, my writing group be acknowledged. Uh, I've been in a writing group for a number of years and um, right now, the, there's four people that are in the writing group with it, along with myself currently. Uh, and um, but there's also the people that were in the writing group before as well. Uh, that that if I hadn't have had that writing group, I don't know if I would have kept writing, especially as a teacher, where you're working so hard, and I was always working. Uh, 
you know, late at night and everything. I was, I'm a bit of a over, we didn't discuss workaholic stuff, but I can tend that way. Uh, and if I hadn't had the writing group where I knew I had to have some writing to share regularly, I don't know that I would have kept writing and that I would have ever had this book. So I'm really thankful to my writing group. So I wanted to give them a, a opportunity. This group is called Four Words. I wanted to get give them an opportunity to read because they mean a lot to me. And uh, they're all reading something that they wrote that has to do with work. So I don't know if you guys are going to open up your videos now or I'm going to start with I'm going alphabetically <laughs> with first name. So I'll start with Oniko and uh, Oniko is uh, the she and I are the longest running members. Uh, we met years back through a Manitoba Writers Guild uh, activities sort of and started. And Oniko writes uh, a variety of things. Uh, uh, and we, we go for walks most Mondays now because uh, we live nearby and we can be outside and safely walk and stuff like that. And um, uh, she does poetry and fiction but she's wor working on currently this wonderful series of stories that are called the she stories about this pretty anxious woman. <laughs> so I'll let Aniko take it away. So unmute yourself if you haven't. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, Luella. Yes, she uh, does tend to be anxious and she's anxious about a lot of things. And so um, I'm just going to read a piece from one of her, her anxious stories. So when the story opens, she is having computer problems at work and we come in just as she's phoned the IT department for assistance. The IT guy's voice comes back. Well, everything looks okay at this end. I'm going to ask you to check your cables for me. She worries about checking the cables. This won't take long. I just need you to look at the back of your computer, find the blue cable and trace it to the wall. She puts the receiver down on the desk and peers behind the computer's box thingy. There's a thousand colored cables branching out from the back of it, but she sees the blue one immediately and breathes a sigh of relief. I see it, she says. Okay, I want you to follow it to where it's plugged into the wall. She puts down the receiver again. She stares at where the cable disappears behind her desk, downward. Of course, she picked today to wear her new short stretchy dress. Calling her hem down as far as she can, she kneels and ducks her head until she can see a jumble of cables tied together, spies the blue one as it shoulders its way out and sees it run behind her desk leg, along the baseboard and behind her table. Backing slowly out from underneath her desk, she winces as she knocks her head on the keyboard tray. This time, she doesn't bother hauling her hem down, but simply crawls on her hands and knees under the table. She can hear a tiny, tinny voice coming from the area of her desk. Hello, hello, have you found the end of the cable? Ignoring him, she continues to crawl along the wall until she comes to her bookshelf, behind which her cable nimbly slips. Only it does not come out the other side. Standing, she starts quickly stacking the table with books. She worries that the IT guy will get tired of waiting and hang up thinking that she's too stupid to follow a blue cable. Running out of room and sweating now, she piles the books on the floor, stepping around them as they fall over. Finally, she's able to pull a bookshelf out enough to see behind it, then drops to her knees, totally unaware that her new stretchy dress is feeling much more comfortable now since it is no longer being stretched. She stares sadly at the blue cable lying loose-limbed, an injured animal its plug-in head broken away from the rest of its snake body, mortally wounded by the weight of Taoist and Stoic philosophic wisdom. Now she becomes aware of a knocking sound and suddenly her office door is flung open. Startled, she rocks back on her heels, turns and blows her tangled bangs out of her eyes while reaching fruitlessly for the hem of her new stretchy dress. He avoids looking at her, only to then take in the phone's abandoned receiver, the lopsided keyboard tray, the hastily piled books on the table and the floor, the bookshelf pulled partway out of the wall from the wall and the scattered papers beneath her desk. I'm from IT, he says. And that's the end of that story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aniko. Poor old she. 
Okay, and uh, Connie Cartledge is next. And uh, Connie, I know from way back, because we were in high school together. And uh, then there were a number of years where we never really saw each other. She was living elsewhere and everything. And then we're uh, back together again. And uh, uh, we both uh, have been, you know, I looked at, both of my parents have passed last year. Uh, and uh, Connie, her father is gone and she, her mother, she still is, is looking after. So we've kind of really have a connection there and stuff. And uh, uh, Connie writes uh, poetry and creative nonfiction and always has some kind of interesting story to tell about what's going on. So take it away, Connie. Thanks, Luella. Yeah, I'm the newest member of the group, but I think I've known Luella the longest. So, <laughs> um, and I do want to thank you, Luella, for sharing your spotlight um, with our whole writing group. That's very generous of you. Um, so for much of my working life, I was an early childhood educator in Canada and in the States and then an early childhood education instructor at Red River College in Winnipeg. And when I retired, I decided to open my home to babies in need of temporary care. Um, and nobody warned me about the hardest part of the job. So this is called Foster Mom. I cry and cry and cry and hold her snowflake sleeper in a ball against my face. I gaze at her empty crib, then dismantle it and pack it away. I discard the baby wash that she was allergic to anyway. I remove the rubber play mats, exposing the bare vinyl laminate of the living room floor. I empty and scrub the diaper pail, leaving no trace. I watch videos on my phone, First carrots, first giggles, first roll from back to front. I rearrange the nursery like she was never there. Thank you, Connie. That's such a heartbreaking one. And next, alphabetically, is Heather Teedsinus and Heather writes a variety of things. Uh, she writes uh, little poetry for little kids and she has middle, I always forget the names of the middle age, the elementary, what I would call elementary age, middle year age kids. And she writes a variety of things. And she also uh, does a lot of neat crafts and uh, uh, made me this wonderful cover for my journals. Out of this is called it's felting stuff felting. that I read. It's, it, she'll tell you more if she wants. To. <laughs> she has a site called Hope's Treasures. Hope's Crafted Treasures on oh, Hope's Facebook. Crafted yeah. Treasures. Okay. Thank okay. You. So take it away, Heather. Thank you, Luella. Um, so I'm going to be reading an excerpt from an early middle grades manuscript in progress entitled Beetle Boy, about an 11 year old boy named Jacob who's longing to be famous sorry, who's longing to be a famous star overshadows even his deepest, darkest secret. If I were Spider-Man, I would have just been this normal boy who got bit by a spider and then had all kinds of cool spidey powers. But I didn't get bitten by a spider and I was never a normal boy. I was a beetle. In this excerpt, Jacob recalls a series of social workers that he's encountered since becoming human and living in a foster home with other parentless boys. In the two months I'd been living here until it happened, I'd already had three caseworkers. Footnote, caseworkers, what they call grownups who work with cases. They're kind of like detectives, but instead of a badge and a gun, they carry clipboards. They don't get to solve mysteries. So maybe they're not really like detectives after all. The first one was really nice. Her name was Miss Melinda and she was beautiful. She had wavy hair and when the sun hit it just a certain way, it was impossible to tell what color it was. One moment it was red, the next blackish brown, then bronze with golden highlights, like an Oscar statue. Whenever I saw her, all I could do was stare. 
After a couple of weeks, Miss Belinda stopped coming to see me and a new guy showed up instead. He told me his name was Spike and that all his coworkers called him Spike and that all his motorcycle buddies called him Spike because of his spiky gelled hair. Three things you should know about Spike. Number one, the house manager called him Simon. Number two, the dude actually drives a Prius. Number three, motorcycle buddies? Yeah, right, face palm. Anyway, he was pretty okay for a while. He sometimes took me to McDonald's and didn't say anything when I ordered my meal supersized with a chocolate milkshake. He even let me try on his leather jacket, which I'm pretty sure had never been worn while actually riding a motorcycle <laughs> and told me lame jokes and called me buddy a lot. After a few visits, Spike stopped wearing his leather jacket or putting buckets of gel on his hair. A week later, Miss Allen was my new caseworker. I never did find out what happened to Simon slash Spike, but one time I overheard Miss Allen talking on her cell phone about a Simon who was living in a brain shrinking hospital. I guess the poor guy got brain cancer from all that hair gel. Miss Allen's hair wasn't as pretty as Melinda's. She had gray hair that looked gray, no matter how the sun shone on it. She didn't call me buddy, and she never took me to McDonald's, but she was nice enough, I guess. Footnote, it could have been a lot worse. My best friend Riley says his caseworker always smells like cow farts. Riley lived with a foster family on a farm, so he knows about these things. Thanks, Heather. I love the footnotes that you put in those. And uh, Kelly is next, Kelly Nikki. And Kelly writes mostly poetry. And she's my uh, submit buddy. We once a week text each other to let each other know where we submitted to a journal or magazine or something just to kind of keep us going. Go take it away. Oh, hey everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to read, uh, read tonight, Luella. Um, the piece I'll be reading tonight is called Break Room. And it's a, it's a short piece pretty much about all the signage that you find in a break room that is trying to control the, the chaos of employees come in, coming in and out every day. <laughs> break room. Please put a date on food in the fridge and remove it in a timely fashion. Do not leave dishes in the sink. We are not your mother here. Please be considerate and refill the kettle. Please do not plug in the microwave and kettle at the same time. It will cause the breaker to blow. Thank you. If it does, contact Dave at 468-4444. Do not put your feet on the table or chairs. Other people have to sit and eat where you put them. Thank you. Friday Potluck, please sign up to bring a treat. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> I remember the break room. Yeah, <laughs> there's many stories. You could probably write a, a book about those. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm going to do uh, uh, just a quick a little shorter reading and then uh, Angeline is going to come back and we'll uh, take question audience questions. Uh, so uh, I'll get right to it. Uh, this piece, uh, you know, if you if you've read the book or if you're getting the book, you'll notice that the book is uh, the jobs are sort of set in chronological order, uh, but throughout uh, in different order are sort of the work ethic parts, stories about when I was a kid and where I learned certain skills. And then I tried to kind of tie those skills into the next job thing in some way. So this is uh, called Pushing Through, 12 Years Old. I'm lounging on my bed reading Jane Eyre, and I hear mom say the grass needs cutting. Somehow cutting the grass has become my job. Of course, I'm at the point in the book where the fire has just started. I'll do it in a minute, now. Oh, mom, I'm at a good part now. Shit, I think I whispered it. I heard that, get out there. 
I stomp my way to the side of the house where the rusty push lawnmower leans against the wall beside the recently maimed gas lawnmower. No one would call the grass in our rural yard a lawn, though mum has tried pushing it and the gas lawnmower blades to their limits. It's just cut grass and weeds covering bumps and filling holes. I pull the push mower to the sunny side of the yard, saving the shady area for when I need it to cool off. Back and forth, push, push, back and forth. I can see myself reflected in the picture window, so it feels kind of surreal, an out-of-body experience. Back and forth, push, push, back and forth. The sun is close to the highest port point in its arc through the sky. I'm sweating, my feet are stained green, and I still haven't reached the shade. Of course, this spot I'm in is the most uneven section of ground. Back and forth, push, push, back and forth, stuck, push, 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 stuck, stuck, stuck. I turn my head and watch my reflection pick up the push lawnmower. Then, like some sort of Olympic discus throwing champion, my reflection twirls and heaves it across the yard. And then I'll do a snippet about when I was teaching uh, junior high, one of the snippets about that, snippet seven. Alan catches my eye to let me know I haven't been giving him enough attention. He never talks to me, but likes me to talk to him. He's aged out of the special class for kids who have trouble coping in the regular classroom, so they've integrated him back into one, mine, and there's no educational assistant attached. Right now, he's holding a chair over his head. They chose this class, a mix of 32 students, a number of English as a second language kids, the brightest grade seven student in the school, another guy who regularly breaks out singing Mickey Mouse when he forgets his medication, some kids who can barely read or write, a few students with behavioral issues, and a bunch of average students, and now him. He's quiet, unlike the guy he has randomly chosen as his target today but I can tell what he's saying. I'm going to bring this chair down on this guy's fucking head. Across the room, weaving around tables and desks. And the last piece I'll read, oh, uh, it's saying that my internet connection is unstable, so I hope I'm okay. I'm just gonna read the last uh, piece, which is a, uh, when I taught senior high, um, and it's snippet four. A back, oh, sorry, wrong one. Uh, just hang on, I just have lost my place here. What did I have? Page 80. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, number two, snippet two. After months together, most students in this special class designed to help students who find it difficult to work in larger groups have settled down. But on this spring day, Trevor is causing trouble. He pokes a girl's back and then she turns, he burps in her face. He peels an orange, throws bits at students across the room who throw them back. He hums Hockey Night in Canada theme over and over. Students plead with him, then yell at him to shut up. I take a deep breath then spot the lilacs out the window. You know what? I'd love to have the scent of those lilacs in here. Students begin waving their hands. Trevor, why don't you go out there and get me some? He jumps from his seat and is gone before anyone can complain about special treatment. I stay near the window. He soon appears out in the yard, turns, looks up at me and points at a nearby lilac bush. I shake my head at him and point to the furthest end of the yard. Behind me, everyone exhales. Okay, so that's that. Angeline, I think, is going to come back now. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it to you, Angeline.
All right. All right. Oh my God. God. Turn the phone off. Angeline, I've muted your phone, so you can continue to use both videos if you'd like. Oh, okay. Oh. I couldn't get the video to work on the computer screen. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you, yeah. Perfect, because I look better on a computer. All right. <laughs> and this, the idea was that now I can read the questions on my phone and see you at the same time. And if one of me disappears, there's another one of me, so. <laughs> all right, so Ann Thompson from Toronto wants to know, have all these different jobs made you a better writer? Oh, um, probably because just the more, uh, a writer, the more things you notice. And I guess, uh, you know, as a teacher, especially you have to be noticing so many different things going on at so many different times and quickly think of ways to to you know deal with issues as they come and um uh so yeah i i think they have in that in that just that experience because just the funny things that happen in life and everything and and uh it makes for for good material yeah <laughs> and uh Hang on to your hat, Kimmy Beach. Wants oh, to Kimmy. Know, uh, she's going to put you on the spot and ask you about the pile of manuscripts behind you. I know you have a fascinating project in your mind and on paper. <laughs> you know what I ask you? Would you let uh, yeah. us know about the next book? This okay. is an unfair question because I know, but I love it in all caps. Okay, you know what, Kimmy? Kimmy is the uh, first person who sort of saw the manuscript of the work stuff and um uh and it was poetry and just at the time that I was thinking that it probably shouldn't be poetry that it should be prose Kimmy sent me a thing saying that she thought it should be prose and so it was like yeah anyway and I had a bunch of things about games that we played as kids on there which I have so many different ideas that's my problem like I know people have writer's block. My problem is like I become overwhelmed with too many things. Uh, but actually what I'm working on right now is a flash, flash fiction novella uh, on based on Lily's stories, stories of, uh, there's some similarities to me, but it really is fictional. Uh, and so that's what I'm working on right now, but I'm always doing other prose poem, poems and flash fiction and everything and uh but really the big binder right now that I'm working on is the Lily stories the junior high years flash fiction novella very cool uh, that's neat that you were working with Kimmy Beach when you discovered that you were you were not actually writing poetry because I think Kimmy had the same experience with the uh, Noala I'm probably saying that wrong. Yes, yes, but, yeah. yes. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kimmy. <laughs> <laughs> How difficult was it to remain to maintain discipline in writing during COVID? Did COVID test that work ethic? You know, um, it wasn't, I have to, I hate to say this because I know some people are are struggling, but uh, things were pretty much the same for me. I think maybe because I had retired. And so I had to be kind of self-motivated and being retired, I spending more time on my own because other people I know work and everything. And um, so, so my life wasn't that much different with, isn't that much different. Like I kind of, I like, I like to be social, but I kind of like hanging out by myself and, uh, and stuff like that. So I kind of carried on kind of the same. I, I, hate to say that for those of you, but I totally understand those of you that are struggling as well, especially if you're working. It's really hard when you're working at another job and trying to write. And I know that from when I was working. Mm -hmm. Does that answer it? I think so. Okay. All right. Ted Landrum wants to know, is writing work? And oh. which which story was the most work or the least work? Oh, 
you know what? Um, the hardest ones for me to do are the ones to do with teaching because I don't think I'm yet far enough away from teaching. I think more stories maybe to do with teaching will come. So that's why I did it in the little snippets of just little snippets of things that came to my mind because it was just too close. It was too intense and I worked at it for too long. Uh, and um, writing as work, Kimmy Beach and I actually had talked about this and I remember her talking about well, writing should be fun. It's something you want to do. You should enjoy it. And why do we use the word work? Uh, and so sometimes I use the word work just because it's easier to kind of combine poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction. If I'm writing a, a bio or something, my work has peered in. Uh, but if I'm not enjoying it, especially now that I'm retired from paid the paid jobs, if I'm not enjoying it, why am I doing it? So I like to sort of see it. it it's kind of involves work, the revision especially, but the first drafts are kind of like fun. Is there one story that was the easiest to write? Oh, oh, you're got, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I can think, I, I'll, I'll, if something comes to me, I'll come back to it. Probably just those yeah. little, those little snippets like that opening one when I could look at a photo like this, yeah. you know? Yeah, maybe. I love the little snippet about the telephone operator. Oh yeah. That was a horrible job. Sorry. <laughs> I hope there's no telephone. Operator. <laughs> that, it's not a really a big job anymore, is it? <laughs> but you'll have to read. I don't think they're offended. Pavlov's dogs. Yes. Bing operator. May I help you? Uh, Sierra wants to know, is there one job that stands out as the most impactful or one you wish could be removed from your past? So I'm guessing impactful would be in a positive way or oh, um, shaped you in the most. Well, you know what? Teaching probably has the most impact because it was so varied and so many layers of people you worked with and everything. Um, and the job that I disliked the most you know what? I have to say, I really didn't care for that working at the donut shop. <laughs> I'd rather do, I, I don't know. I, I, there was just something about that donut shop that was difficult for me. <laughs> but yeah. uh, they all had good things and bad things. I, did I answer the question? I think so. That's okay. The story that was hard to read was the one where that that guy turned out to be um, dangerous. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the job at the time wasn't uh, because I didn't know that he was crazy or whatever. I don't yeah. know. That's not the term I should use. But um, but after the fact, when my dad said, and I'd seen the thing in the news and I didn't connect. And when dad called me and he said, hey, do you remember that guy? And I was like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, that was quite shocking that I was like, right there with that guy quite often yeah. but I think he was too scared of my dad like he was a smaller guy and my dad was a big guy and my dad was really a nice guy but he was he was a big guy and so I don't think he would have ever done anything to me but yeah um, Ariel wants to know do the terms flash fiction and novella even fit in the same sentence oh Ariel she's putting uh, up her dukes yeah uh, okay you know what I've got a book called do I have it right here this if you want to know this book by Nancy Stolman going short tells you all about flash novellas and flash novels and it's a long thing we'll discuss it sometime but if you read this book you'll learn all about it she's great I would think it'd be similar to like a a collection of of linked poems you know, like they're yeah. separate, but yeah. they, they connect. They yeah, connect. Then there's two kind of differences, but uh, but yeah, yeah. And actually, this this book, Glass Bricks, is kind of a linked flash creative nonfiction. So pretend that that's all fiction, and it's kind of linked and tells you the story of this person. Although a flash fiction novella would be eventually maybe slightly more connected, but. 
Um, Georgette wants to know, do you write every day and at certain times or are you most spontaneous? You know what? I'm better in the morning before my head gets filled with a bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, and um, so I try to write in the morning if I'm going to write. But uh, I have to say, um, I try to write every day. <laughs> but I don't always get there. I figure if I'm doing something, uh, my goal, it just like physical activity. I have the goal to do something physical every day, whether it be Tai Chi or riding a bike or walking or, or whatever. Uh, but, uh, my goal with writing is to do something to do with writing. So whether it's new writing, revision, uh, submitting, uh, reading, uh, resources to do reading other people's writing that I admire, so I try to kind of put that together so I don't feel guilty if I don't actually write, but I'm always thinking about it and jotting ideas down and stuff. So let's call that writing every day. For sure. Um, Luke Lester asks, I oh, enjoy my when you, <laughs> I figured family, hang on. I enjoy when you rant, rant on the phone about things that piss you off. Does this book feature more stories from an annoyed narrator? <laughs> okay, well, the really annoyed stuff I wouldn't be writing <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so you save so those for Luke. I, I yeah, I'll say I <laughs> save those to entertain Luke. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> he wants me to write my rants, but that's a whole nother. <laughs> Sorry, are we running out of time there? John? I think so. I'd say we've reached the natural end of the questions if you folks are oh, uh, keen oh, to you. wind the evening down. Sure. Oh, uh, so I, I just want to th thank, I'll wind it down, I guess. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, 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 it's great to have your support and I hope you like the book. And I want to thank Angeline, even though poor Angeline has, We do have a dramatic pause. So thank you, oh. Peter, my group and, <laughs> and thank you, McNally and everybody. Thank you. Thanks. I think I had a bad connection there. And Angeline, do you have any closing words you might like to offer yourself? Um, buy Luella's book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for including me, Luella. Thanks yeah. for running the show, John. And yeah, especially if you have a book club, get them all to buy a copy and that's the best experience. Discuss yeah. it together. Thank you so much, Angeline. Buy, uh, buy this book is the evergreen closing comment for any event of Gally Robinson. So we do very much appreciate that. Again, the book is Glass Bricks and it's available from At Bay Press at McNally Robinson Booksellers. I'd also like to uh, end on a note of gratitude myself, uh, thanking, of course, all the readers from the writing group in particular for taking the time out to join us, uh, Aniko, Connie, Heather, and Kelly. Uh, thank you so much for joining and sharing your work with us here this evening. Uh, many thanks to all of you in the chat and watching now on Zoom or on YouTube or in the future on YouTube as this video will remain uh, so we can cast something forward into the future in gratitude. I would like to apologize uh, on behalf of McNally Robinson to any telephone operators that may have been offended by the contents of tonight's presentation. Uh, please note that we take uh, no blame whatsoever there. But, uh, and I'd also like to express a huge thanks, of course, to At Bay Press for publishing this book in the first place and for Matt Jodry uh, from At Bay Press for all his help planning the evening. And of course, finally, your wonderful host for this evening, Angeline Schellenberg, whose books you may also buy at McNally Robinson. And of course, yeah. our guest of honor this evening, Luella Lester. Thank you all so Thanks. very much. And uh, operators are great. It just <laughs> wasn't the job for me. <laughs> a little bit of backpedaling at the end of our event. But thank you all so much once again. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. Bye.